Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Walking the Way Pilgrimage and the Camino de Santiago. Our leader and teacher this afternoon is Chris Clark. Chris spent the first half of his life in upstate New York, where he received degrees from uh, Cornell and the University of Rochester. Chris started out as a high school Spanish teacher, which must have helped a bit along the Camino, and then spent 37 years helping teachers figure out how best to use technology from uh, overhead projectors to virtual reality. He retired from the University of Notre Dame in 2019, but still loves to mess with media on the computer. Uh, and I think he means he knows what he's doing when he does that. Chris lives on three rural acres in Saugatuck Township and spends as much time outdoors as he can. He coordinates a hiking club and the visitor's center in Douglas published his map of local hiking trails. He works on the Crop Hunger Walk every year and is active in a local conservation group. Last fall, Chris walked 500 miles on the Camino de Santiago in Spain. This year, he has a goal of hiking 52 different trails, a new one each week. His favorite activity, though, is playing with his seven grandchildren. There's a handout, which I will uh, hand out at the end. And Chris tells me that uh, if you have a question, you're welcome to ask it at any time by raising a hand. And then I'll run over with a microphone so that our uh, uh, students at home can hear your question as well. Chris. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, those of you who, if there are any fellow geeks out there, um, I'm using a, a presentation setup that works really, it's very cool, if, particularly if you're a Mac user. On my iPad, I have the presentation notes, but on my phone, which is over there, are the slides. So I can control this from that. And uh, it's really very nice. <laughs> so I can kind of read what I'm supposed to be saying up here. So what is a pilgrimage? Well, on the handout, uh, you'll have this definition. Um, a pilgrimage, in, in my view, a pilgrimage is a respectful, reverential journey to experience a sacred place. Now, for some people, that might include going to Graceland, if you're an Elvis fan. But today, we're going to talk about religious uh, pilgrimages, where the traveler hopes to hear an echo of God or get in touch with the divine. Today, we're, we're going to start with a discussion, a little discussion about what a pilgrimage is in general and how a pilgrim is different from a tourist. Then you're going to learn about a specific pilgrimage, the Way of St. James, also called the Camino. And finally, I'm going to use some of the seven stages of pilgrimage as identified in this book, which I'll talk about a little later, to sort of talk about my own experience on the Camino. I plan to have lots of time for questions and discussions, because I'm sure that a lot of you have your own experience. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have walked part, of the, part or all of the Camino de Santiago? One, two... Two. Okay, cool. Um, how many of you are thinking about walking part or all of the Camino de Santiago? Well, maybe half a dozen folks. Okay. Don't put it out of your mind. I was by far not the oldest person out there. We ran into several people who were well into their 80s, lots of people in their 70s. You don't have to walk 500 miles. You can walk 60 miles or less. Uh, so... Pilgrimage is really a very significant human endeavor. Each year, one out of, get this, one out of every 40 human beings on the planet, one out of every human beings on the planet does some kind of pilgrimage. That's pretty amazing. For 15,000 years, people of several faiths have walked 33 miles around Mount Kailash, Kailash in Tibet in order to receive good fortune. Here we go. As many as 20 million Hindu pilgrims make a visit to the sacred waters at Kanwar every year. Over 2 million Muslims make the Hajj to Mecca. About 150,000 people visit the Buddhist temple shrines of Shikoku in Japan. Three and a half million people, Jews and others, visit Jerusalem. And Christians make pilgrimages to Lourdes. Of course, I put Lourdes up there, being from Notre Dame, right? 
Um, Christians make pilgrimages to Lourdes, Rome, Canterbury, and many other places. And as I mentioned, I'm going to talk more in specific about one Christian pilgrimage, the Camino. So, hello. Yes. Okay. Um, there are lots of reasons why people make pilgrimages. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of them, a few of them. Piety is one, right, to fulfill some kind of religious obligation, or as I mentioned before, to get in touch with the divine in some way. Atonement, to, to make up for some uh, sin that you've committed, to even in the olden days, to complete a criminal penalty, or to receive an indulgence, which I'll talk about later. Gratitude, to, to give thanks for something good that's happened in your life, or a prayer that's been answered. Uh, it, healing. Uh, maybe you're looking for a, a physical cure. So if you're going to Lourdes, for example, you might be hoping to actually be physically cured or maybe a psychological issue that you're dealing with. Uh, some kind of a quest. Maybe you're looking for personal meaning or the answer to some kind of a question and you want some time to think about it or maybe a specific physical goal that you have. And simply adventure, right? Some people just the idea of a long pilgrimage and to have this physical challenge is something that motivates a lot of people. And in my case, a lot of it was as a milestone to sort of mark an important event in your life. In my case, it was retirement. Some people, it might be marriage. It might be after the death of a loved one. Uh, you hear a lot of stories about people who are sort of trying to deal with a, a spouse who's passed away or a child and that they have time to think and so on. So lots and lots of different reasons why people go on pilgrimage. Being pilgrim is, as you would imagine, is different from being a tourist. And the book, uh, the book about the art, art of pilgrimage I'm gonna talk about, talks about this a lot. And in other sources, they talk as well. Uh, for one, you have a, a very personal goal, right? Now, sometimes you have certain goals on a, on a tourist trip, but on the pilgrimage, it's a much more intentional kind of a thing. Uh, you experience things directly. You're not simply watching, right? You're, you're actually experiencing this voyage um, on a pilgrimage. There's some kind of inner journey, spiritual journey happening when you're on a, a pilgrimage as well. I think some of these things may be happening when you're a tourist, but they're pretty much all happening when you're a pilgrim. It also is often usually it offers, involves a significant kind of physical activity. Now, not all, not all pilgrimages are terribly long, but in the case of the Camino, certainly it can be quite long or some kind of a struggle or challenge. And finally, I like to think of it as poetic. I love poetry. And I like to think of this as a very poetic experience. There's really more happening than it seems on the surface of things, right? So that's why I sort of think of it as a sort of poetic experience. So we talked about a little bit about you know what is the what is a pilgrimage and um, how is that different from being a trap just a normal tourist. Now I want to, want to talk a little bit more very specifically about the Camino de Santiago, the, the way of Saint James. Um, this is a pilgrimage that ends at the tomb of Saint James the Apostle in Santiago. Right, we know very little about James, really. Um, the Bible says that one day he and his family were out fishing. He and his father and his brother and some other folks were out fishing. Uh, it was, and they were having a really terrible day, right? And so Jesus comes along and he says, try again, right? And so he does, and they catch so much, many fish that the boat nearly sinks, right? As a result, Jesus recruits uh, at least James and John, and I forget if maybe there were more apostles who got hooked that day. Um, and he make, calls them the famous phrase, fishers of men. Um, and the brothers turned out to be so feisty, right, that um, they were called the sons of thunder, right? They, they, they were not, uh, what's the word? Uh, they were not always gentle, let's say. They were, they were pretty, uh, pretty feisty. And they were, James and John were not uh, run-of-the-mill apostles. They were really part of the inner uh, circle, right? Peter, James, and John really were among the three most sort of critical disciples. 
10 years after uh, Jesus' death, we know that Herod Agrippa, not the same Herod as when Jesus was a baby, Herod Agrippa has him beheaded. Um, he, he evidently left Jerusalem, he comes back and he gets in trouble and he loses his head. So we know those things pretty much for sure. Now, as a quick side note, having being a language teacher, this really fascinated me. I wonder where the heck do you get James out of Yaakov, right? Yaakov is the Hebrew name, which perhaps was the actual original name um, of James. In Greek, that comes Yakobos. And I've read this wonderful fictional book that talked about probably in the area where he lived, there were people speaking um, uh, Greek, Hebrew, Latin. Um, what's the, I'm having a... Um, Aramaic, at least those languages. And it's quite likely that he spoke more than one of those languages, right? So Yaakov, Yakobos was probably something like the original name. And in Spanish, right? Spanish is, grew out of Latin, which sort of grew out of Greek. And so you get Sanctus Jacobus, which comes to Santiago, Santiago, right? So that makes sense. Santiago is actually a very, very popular boy's name for you probably, you probably met men whose names are, name is Santiago, very, very popular, particularly in Spain, because he's the patron saint. Um, and in English, this is the part that drove me crazy. So Jacobus to Jacomus to Jacomus to James, I don't know how that happened, but that happened, and then James to James. So anyway, I found that really interesting. <laughs> Um, so, but there's a lot we don't know for sure about James. There's a lot of legends. Some of them are clearly legend, but a lot of them, I believe, are plausible. So I have a lot of people say, there's no way that James is buried in Compostela. You don't know that. There's no proof that he is, but that likewise, there's no proof that he's not. So it's conceivable, probably not, right? But conceivable that those really are the bones of the apostle James. In, in Santiago. So the, here are some of the things that the, that the stories say, that James went to Spain. So this, there's stories about how Jesus sent all the apostles over and, and after he died, they kind of split up and they said, okay, we well, are gonna go here and I'm gonna go there, right? Um, Thomas, the apostle Thomas died in Southern India. We know that for a fact, that's a long way. So it's not weird, it wouldn't be weird that, Jesus would have, that James would have gone as far as Northwestern Spain. And this is what the Roman Empire looked like when um, James was alive. So another legend is that, <clears throat> that Mary appeared to James on a pillar in Saragossa and told him to return to, to uh, Jerusalem. Do any of you, have you ever, any, any of you ever known a Hispanic woman whose name is Pilar? Pilar, that's pillar, Pilar, that's Mary of the pillar, right? Uh, after his death, James, the, again, another legend is that his body and the head, of course, is separated. And I think there's an indication there in the, in the paintings that the, the angel sort of holding up, let me hold on to the head because it's not attached. Uh, his body was claimed by his followers. And then now the legend said he was taken in a stone boat. I've heard, in, you know, the legend could be interpreted in different ways. One of the things that I read was maybe the boat, the, the stone boat, was a boat that was shipping stone building materials on the Mediterranean. So in that case, a stone boat could be possible. Boat made out of stone, eh, probably not. Not a lot of floating going on there. And when he gets to Spain, supposedly uh, the local queen or, or woman who's ruling the area sends him a couple of wild bulls, sends the, the helpers a couple of wild bulls to drag the body to where they want it to be buried and you know, trying to mess them up. And, and as soon as these helpers see the bulls, they become tame. And that's another legend that's part of this. And then finally, uh, the legend says that James was buried in a villa of a, one of the Roman families that he helped to convert. Now, the Romans uh, were in Spain for a long time, but they eventually left. Right? So what happened then? Well, uh, There's a little Spanish history for you. So Rome controlled the, the Iberian Peninsula from about 200 BC to in the, four, the fifth century. So a long time, you know, five, at least 500 years. 
Um, they built and they built an amazing system of roads, right? Some of those are indicated on the diagram here. And some of those roads became part of the route that the Camino followed later on. Um, in the fifth century, these German folks invaded and kind of kicked the Romans out. The Roman Empire was falling apart anyway. So this, these German folks came in and, and uh, took over and different tribes and so on, took over parts of the peninsula and became Christian. So it was a Christianizing uh, thing that was going on as well, although the Romans were, were already becoming Christian before they left. 300 years later, a group of Muslims come up from Africa and Spain they're referred to as the Moors and they take over very quickly. And so this, this is the, the extent of that empire that they had went all the way up into France, right? And this is about the early 700s that this is starting. And almost immediately the folks up in the North in Asturias decided, no, nope, we don't like you guys, we're gonna get rid of you. And they began what in Spain is called the Reconquest. I wanna say it in Spanish, the Reconquista. Um, and so here's what's, what it looks like about a hundred years later. You have this kingdom of Asturias up in the north, right? And you still have a very large um, Moorish Muslim kingdom below that. And up way up north there, you see Charlemagne, right? Charlemagne is starting to become powerful. So all kinds of interesting things going on in Spanish history between the time that, that St. James is buried and the time that things pick up again. So here's where the story picks up again. At the beginning of the eighth century, 713, 714 or something, in a, well, no, this, that's not there quite yet. Um, there's a uh, Charlemagne at the end, this is the end of the eighth century. Charlemagne, there's a legend that Charlemagne, uh, that St. James appeared to Charlemagne in a dream and told him to follow the Milky Way to Spain to find his tomb. Now that's probably baloney, it probably never happened. It was probably made up by somebody a few hundred years later, but it's part of the legend of Santiago, St. James. So the, the, one of the interesting sort of poetic things is that the, the Milky Way is seen as sort of the, the images of the saints who have gone before up in the sky. And then that's mirrored on the ground in the different shrines that you follow to get to Santiago. I think that's kind of cool. So while, uh, oh, there you go. There's your Milky Way. Can have any, do you any, can any of you see the Milky Way from Holland? We, we got a lot of light pollution here. I actually, I'm, I'm very interested in light pollution. That's one of my sort of outdoorsy things. So I went up to this neat park, the Headlands Park up by Mackinac City, hoping to see some, some real Milky Way. And it, we were watching the weather it was pretty, this was just last week, it was a little iffy. So we did end up being able to see the Milky Way for about 10 minutes. <laughs> so after this dream, right, um, Charlemagne goes, goes off into Spain and starts to take over. Of course, he's, he's not necessarily going because St. James asked him, he just wants a bigger empire, right? And so he's over there fighting and taking things over and uh, the Basques who are his first obstacle are not very happy. He takes over Pamplona, the big city, a very famous city where they have the running of the bulls. Uh, and so the Basques who are there uh, kind of fight back and they kill one of his paladins, his knights, who may have even been his nephew called Roland. So you maybe have heard of the song of Roland that that legend begins in Northwestern, Northeastern Spain. And it's also connected with the whole mythology of the, the Camino. So here's where the here's where St. James sort of comes back for, for, for real, quote unquote. In 813, 814, a hermit sees a shower of stars over a hill near where some, the current city of Santiago is. And he said, and he hears these angels and he, he goes to his bishop and says, hey, I, you know, I, I saw this thing over here. I, I think something's going on over there. And so this bishop um, and gets, evidently the bishop and the king, it's a small place. The king is, I guess, not as big of a big deal in those days. So the bishop and the king go to this hill and they dig it up and they find these bones. And uh, they decide for various reasons that they're the bones of St. James. And eventually the Pope says, yep, you're right. Those are the bones of St. Bones of James. And that's where it all starts. And it proves to be really helpful to these proto-Spanish, shall we say, 
because there is no such thing as quote unquote Spain yet, but these Asturians in the north of Spain are trying to get rid of the, these Muslims who have taken over the peninsula and to have a, an apostle on your side, that's pretty cool, right? So there's a legend, and this is there's absolutely no basis in fact for this, but there's a big legend that this battle very shortly after they find these bones, St. James appears on a white horse and kills a whole bunch of these Moors. And so he's now called Santiago Matamoros. If you've ever been in Northern Mexico on the border with, uh, uh, with Texas, there's a town called Matamoros, right? It's not a very flattering name. St. James the Moor Slayer is you know, not exactly a friendly kind of thing. Um, shortly after that, uh, king Alfonso, Alfonso II, this guy, the, the king of, of Asturias, who was called Alfonso the Chaste. I don't know if that means he didn't have any kids, but he was called Alfonso the Chaste. Uh, builds a church at the tomb site and the pilgrimages start to begin. So the, the first local pilgrimages began at the end of the, the ninth century. In 950, as things start to go outside of Spain, and this famous bishop of Le Puy in France makes the first sort of famous pilgrimage from outside of Spain. And that's why some of, if some of you are familiar with the Camino, if you're really hardcore, you start the pilgrimage in Le Puy, which adds another like four or 500 miles <laughs> to the pilgrimage. So you go from there to the border uh, where, where um, Ron and I started uh, the pilgrimages uh, and go from there. So he was the first one. In, uh, but the, but these, the Moors, these Arabs, they're still there, right? They're still in the way. They're still causing problems. They knock down the first shrine. And so there's just, it's really kind of dicey getting to, to Santiago for a while. Um, but by the year 1037, it's fairly safe. And in 1078, they begin to build the current uh, cathedral. So it's estimated about this, that at this time, there's, there might have been as many in this uh, heyday of this pilgrimage, there might have been as many as a half a million people. So I've, I've seen all kinds of numbers, but suffice to say there were an awful lot of folks who were going to Santiago. And one reason they were doing it was it was a lot closer than Jerusalem, right? If you're a European, you know, going to Jerusalem is not only dangerous, but it's a long, long way. So there were all different ways to get there, and it becomes very, very popular. In 1140, a famous book, the Codex Calixtinus, is written and it includes uh, descriptions of the routes, some of the customs. It's actually billed as the first sort of tourist book <laughs> that was ever gone, written. Um, so lots of advice for pil pilgrims. In 1214, St. Francis of Assisi makes the pilgrimage to uh, Santiago. After that, things start to get a little difficult. So in the early 1300s, the Templars, so there are all kinds of crazy le legends about them, but one of their early roles was protecting pilgrims and protecting pilgrims on the Camino. But if you know the history of the Templars in the very early 1300s, the French decide they don't like them so much. And they, they actually, didn't they burn a whole bunch of them at the stake, you know, in the early 1300s? So that kind of, you know, they had to find someone else to sort of help keep the roads safe. Um, after that. Um, so they fell out of favor. Um, there were also wars and hunger, and in the 1347, the plague. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we think the pandemic was not so hot. I don't think I would have been or wanted to be around for this thing. Right? So there, it sort of has its ups and downs. In 1520, this is kind of the killer. Right, Martin Luther decide, declares all pilgrimages, pilgrimages should be stopped. All pilgrimages, they don't like them. So of course, at first, Martin Luther wasn't, it wasn't a big deal, but that didn't last very long, right? The Reformation really took hold. And, and so part of that Protestant thought was that pilgrimages, not so great. Um, they also were not in favor of indulgences. An indulgence is a remission from sin. So if you you know, think that maybe your chances of getting into heaven aren't so great, you want an indulgence. And one way to get indulgence is to make a pilgrimage. And you actually get a piece of paper when you finish the pilgrimage that says, you know, your sins are forgiven or the time that you owe it to purgatory before you get to heaven is now cut 
and you can go straight there. Um, in fact, this right now is a holy year. Uh, the holy years for this, for the, uh, the Santiago, for the pilgrimage, for the Camino, are the years when St. Saint, Saint James Day, which is the 25th of July, when it falls on a Sunday, that's called a holy year. And in those years, you can get a plenary indulgence, which means all that time that you would have spent in purgatory is cut off. And you can still do that. If you're a Catholic, you go on the pilgrimage, you can, you know, fill out the form and you get a piece of paper that says, yep, you're all forgiven. Um, one of the things that happened with the Reformation was that people were selling indulgences. The popes, the bishops, they were selling it, they were making money. Now, you can imagine why Martin Luther didn't like that, right? So that was not a good thing. And, it, and, so the, and also the cult of saints, the sort of thinking of saints as little almost gods, right? That sort of fell out of favor, which is one of the reasons why if you're a Protestant, you probably don't hear so much about saint this and saint that, right? I grew up in a Catholic church. We heard lots about lots of different saints. I think the Episcopal church, right? Church of England, they're, they're still um, a, more of a big deal, but there are other denom Christian denominations, you know, saint, we talk about saints with a sort of a small S in the most of the Protestant denominations. So, so we're in the 1500s now, 1559, Sir Francis Drake, right, who was a, you know, arch Protestant, you know, decided that he didn't like what was going on in Santiago with the pilgrimage. And so he sort of threatened the city. I think he was said, I'm going to get those bones and, you know, take them away or throw them away or whatever. And so the Spanish folks at that time, you know, they were very nervous. So they hid the bones and they stayed hidden for a long time. So think about it, right? You've got the You've got Martin Luther saying, don't go on a pilgrimage, and it's called the saints thing, the bones are hidden, all these diseases. You know, it's not a good time for pilgrimage. Right? Nevertheless, you know, the, it, the things keep going on and people still keep making the pilgrimage. In fact, in 1779, John Adams, who was on his way to France to sort of finish signing the treaty, the peace treaty with, with uh with the Brits, right? I think they were meeting in France with a Treaty of Paris or something that ended the, the Revolutionary War. Help me with that, any historians out here? I think they, they did the negotiation in Paris. And so, so uh, Adams lands in, in Spain and, and he walks the Camino backwards. <laughs> I mean, not like this, right? But <laughs> in reverse. <laughs> and and uh, his son, John Quincy Adams is with him too. So that's another little detail about the sort of history of the Camino. So, all right, what happens then? Well, at the end of the 19th century, 1879, they find the bones again. Evidently, they were buried down below where the altar is. They were put in some kind of a chamber and they found the bones again. And they went to the Pope and they said, look, you know, we need, we need you to agree that these are the bones. And so they did some more or less the sort of debatably scientific tests on the bones. And Pope Leo XIII says, yep, that's St. James, you're good. Um, not long after that, so this is the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century was a tough time for Spain. Right? You had World War I, they were going through sort of the, the, the fall of the monarchy in Spain, and they were going through a republic. Spain had a really nasty civil war from 1936 to 1939. Um, and then the Second World War, where, where Franco was kind of buddies with Hitler and, and different things. So there was all kinds of stuff going on. Not a great time to be a pilgrim in Spain. Um, when all that was over, though, I, I don't remember all. I've read something about this, but I don't remember all the details. Franco sort of courted the church. So this is the, the famous this dictator of Spanish, who some of you will remember, some won't. Um, I remember him very well. He was still alive when I lived there when I was a junior in college. Um, it was, a, was an interesting place to live at the time. Um, but he, he liked the idea of the pilgrimage and did what he could to promote it. Um, but up through the 1970s, there are fewer than a thousand people who are making their way to Santiago. And there is nothing like there is today. The roots were kind of vague. Um, there were no sort of rules or for what you had to do to sort of officially finish the pilgrimage. People would drive, people would walk. There were all kinds of things going on. 
In the 1980s, though, is when it starts to get to more begin to become what it is today. Uh, a man named um, Elias Baliña San Pedro was sort of the hero of the early Camino. Um, he was a, a preacher. He did his dissertation, his college, his doctoral dissertation on the Camino. He was really, really into this. Did a lot of incredible work, and he wasn't the only one. There were there were groups that were getting organized. Things were going. I also think you know we're talking about a time when this is post World War II. People now have money. They have leisure time. You know the the world is changing. People are taking trips, right? So so the world is kind of ripe for this type of experience. It's also post Franco, right? So it's not a repressive country that people don't want to visit because they don't like the idea of supporting a dictatorship. There's all kinds of things happening. Um, one of the things that, that Don Elias did was he came up with the idea for the yellow arrows that you may be familiar with that mark the way of the Camino. He actually, there's all kinds of stories about him going out all alone in the countryside and painting these arrows and the police picking, you know, picking them up and saying, what the heck are you doing? And all kinds of interesting stories. But in 1993, the Camino is declared by UNESCO a World Heritage Site, and that's like the stamp of gold, right? So that's great. Traffic really starts to pick up at that point. Um, in 2010, Martin Sheen's film, The Way, which if you haven't seen, it's a wonderful film. A lot of Americans think that's what brought the Camino back. No, it's not. <laughs> but it, what it did do was it made it something that people in the, in, in the United States recognize. And so more people start to go from this country to, to, the, to the, the Camino. Um, in 2019, three years ago, there were 350,000 people who, who completed the pilgrimage. That was the most that, that they had on the modern record. And then the, the, uh, the pandemic comes. Uh, pandemic was not good for the Camino. Numbers fell off. Uh, this, that whole series of towns that has started to build its livelihood on having these pilgrims come through, they were really kind of screwed, pardon my French, but it was tough for them. Uh, but in 2021 was another holy year, right? It was a, a year that the last year was a year that uh, St. James Day fell on a Sunday. Big deal. They opened the holy door at, in Compostela. You can get your plenary indulgence. Numbers are always up that year. It started to recover. And because it wasn't a great year, the Pope says, all right, you can have another year. And so the, the holy year extended into 2022. And this year, from what I can tell, there they're out to beat the records uh, from before. I looked up the numbers and in, in July last month, there were more than 58,000 uh, pilgrims just in one month uh, got to uh, Santiago. So that's probably a lot more than you wanted to know, but there's some interesting details. And I think it, um, the story of that particular pilgrimage is probably one that reflects in some ways to lots of other pilgrimages. They have their ups and downs because of social pressures, because of what's happening in history, right? And so um, I, even though you know probably more about that one than you wanted to know, I, I'm hoping you found it interesting. There's all kinds of interesting details there. So you know what a pilgrimage is now uh, in terms of that particular one, you a little background. But what about the, the experience of being a pilgrim? And I think that's what the, when I submitted my proposal, they, they kind of wanted, they don't really want me to get up here and say, here's me on day three having a cocktail with my friends. So we're not going to do that much. But this wonderful book, The Art of Pilgrimage, which I would recommend, it's really, it's very good. It's, it's a bit of a slog at first. But if you're not really interested in pilgrimages, maybe no. <laughs> but if you're interested in it, it's worth giving it the time to get into it because there's some really good information. And he borrows this Phil Cousineau it's on the handout. It's all listed in the handout. Um, the, um, he borrows from all kinds of other disciplines and history and ties lots of interesting stuff together. So I enjoyed it. Um, and he identifies these seven stages of pilgrimage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow those and kind of tell you a little bit about my experience um, by doing that. So at stage one of the pilgrimage, you feel a longing. There's a sense that a crossroads has been reached maybe, 
Um, it's like something's missing, right? Or, or maybe there's, you have a mystery that you need to solve. Um, each stage, um, at least I managed to identify for each of his stages, a metaphor. And the metaphor for this one is a lamp, uh, illuminating the darkness, bringing light, uh, bringing the light of knowledge uh, and so on. So that's the sort of metaphor you're feeling along. You're looking for that light. You're looking for the knowledge. For me, the idea of the pilgrimage started in 2009. Now, I must have heard about it before that <clears throat> because I was a Spanish major in college. I lived in Spain for a year. I had, I'm kind of a, a Hispanophile and you know, read lots of books. I'm sure that I had read, I've read, you know, I think it's mentioned in Michener's Iberia, if you've read that. And so it's, so I'm sure I'd heard of it before. But in 2009, I had the wonderful opportunity to spend the summer in Toledo, Spain, um, on Notre Dame's nickel. So I put in a proposal to teach a class. Now, normally they would only let the, the Spanish professors do that. And I was a, you know, a mere mortal who worked in the teaching center um, but I learned that no one had applied to teach the class that summer. And I thought, well, what the heck? The worst they can do is say no. And lo and behold, they didn't. <laughs> so I had this wonderful, wonderful time. I spent eight weeks in Spain that summer. The first week, my head was just throbbing because I hadn't spoken Spanish that much in so long. <clears throat> but uh, it was a great experience. So while I was there, I learned about the Camino. Um, and I just immediately said, I have to do this. I just have to do this. So I got uh, an, a blank uh, credential, the little passport that you take from step to step. I got one of those, an empty one to bring back. I got a map. I got a travel guide. And I brought all that stuff back and I kind of put it away, but kept thinking about it, right? Um, I, you know, I'd lived there, but I wanted that, this different kind of experience. And I also thought it, the, the physical challenge would be pretty cool because that same year I had just, was I guess the year before I had biked across Iowa. Have every, anybody of you, any of you ever heard of Ragbri? Yeah. A, fr a friend of mine and I did that twice. So you bike across Iowa, it's seven days, you bike about 70 miles a day, which seems like incredible. It's not that in amazing. <laughs> you can learn to, to have that kind of endurance. And it was a very neat experience. So this, I thought, I can do that. I can walk across Spain. I, can, you know, I did that already. So the long, at stage two, this is about to fall off here. At stage two, you hear a call and it can feel like an itch or a sense of restlessness inside you. Um, and the metaphor is this sort of knocking at the door. You know, destiny is offering you an opportunity and you don't want to miss it. Um, so I wanted to think about what I was going to do in retirement, right? I wanted to have, so this is 2019 was coming up here and, you know, I was, I was going to retire. And so what am I going to do? I, I, I had lots of ideas, to be honest, right? Um, but I really wanted to think, you know, what I, what I, I wanted to think about it seriously. Um, I also wanted to prove to myself that I was still reasonably fit at age 67. Uh, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> some of you saw that. I've seen that age already. Um, it was also a great way to spend some quality time in a country that I had fallen in love with at the age of 19, right? So there's me on the left with my sort of Che Guevara look. And my buddy on the right, uh, this is 1974. Uh, my buddy on the right, he and I are still friends. And we get, we've, he actually came and, and we hung out uh, last fall. Uh, so this is pretty, pretty cool. So it was a time to, to sort of rekindle things and, and spend some quality time in this wonderful place. At stage three, oh, this is the sort of the stage of preparing and departing. I, I, the stages don't necessarily fit to me, but that, that, that's what he, that's how this, the book talks about them. The metaphor here is crossing the threshold passing the guardian on, at the gateway to something new, something happening. And in the art of pilgrimage, uh, Cousineau says, you should plan with intention, but be ready to follow intuition. I love that. Plan with intention, but be ready to follow intuition. So make your plans. Yeah, be ready, but don't let them you know, take over. Um, I began to prepare in 2019. 
Um, that fall, whoops, that fall, um, I, as part of the crop walk, some of you are familiar with that. I've been active with that for a long time. I came up with this idea of, of a training uh, thing that would also be a neat way to sort of bring some funds in. And I decided I was gonna walk 50 miles in three days. So I started at Collin Park and I walked to my house, which is halfway between uh, Douglas and Fenville. So I was 17 or 18 miles. And then I walked the uh, Cal Haven Trail between Kalamazoo and South Haven, that's 34 miles. And I walked that in two days. So I figured if I could walk 17 miles a day for three days, I think I can do this other thing. And it was a very, it was very successful. So I didn't do that every day, <laughs> but in my regular uh, training regime, I got to where I was walking about seven, seven miles a day. Um, and again, that may sound like an awful lot. It's not that crazy. You can get used to that and you don't have to walk four minute miles. You can walk slower than that. It is not a race. Um, uh, one thing I did not do well was I did not train for walking up hills. And I would definitely, do any of you know Rich Ray? Yeah, Rich has written a wonderful book I'm gonna talk about later. And he said that when he trained, I think he went over, what's the park that's over? Well, Pisgah, Pisgah he, could, he could have gone there, but there's also uh, Sanctuary, Sanctuary Woods has, has some great steps. So there's some nice places that have steps that you can walk up. And I would, if you were going to do this, I would suggest making that part of your routine. So you're not surprised when you find yourself walking uphill. Okay. So I planned my own itinerary. I had a buddy who went with me. That was an interesting story. Um, I, I thought a long time about would I go by myself? And I thought that, that would work but I'm not a shy guy, as you might guess. Um, and I have had a really good friend um, all the way through high school. Um, he was my best man. I was his best man. We kind of lost track of each other a couple years after college. And so I hadn't really seen him much for you know 35 years or so. I, we stayed in touch, but I hadn't really seen him much. And I called him one day and I said, or I wrote to him, I said, what do you think? Do you want to try this thing? And I thought, there's no way. There's no way he would want to do this. The guy had got, just gotten over cancer. He had been a smoker. <clears throat> he writes me back and he says, yeah, I'm there. I was just absolutely blown away. And I was a little nervous, I gotta tell you, because I hadn't seen the guy in a long time. It turned out wonderful. And that was actually for me, one of the great benefits of the trip was I got my friend back, right? Which was pretty cool. So I worked up this itinerary, uh, Often people will try to do the Camino in 30 days, 34 days. I said, I'm not rushing. We pl I planned a 37 day itinerary. We averaged 13 miles a day, which sounds a lot, but again, it's not a race. You can walk a few miles and stop, walk a few miles and stop, walk a few miles and stop, and you've got you know, 10, 12 hours to do it, right? So it's not as terrible as, as you might think, not, not as... Uh, insane as folks who've been there can tell you. Um, so one of the things about the Camino, one of the things that people will say about the experience is that typically what people want to do is they'll get to the first place, they'll make a reservation. If you start in France or wherever you start, you make a reservation there, you have a room, you get there, you've got a room. And when you start, you don't have any reservations anywhere. You just walk as far as you want, when you get to where you want to stop, you find a room and then you walk the next day and you find a room and you walk the next day and you find a room and it's worked for a long time. That's not me. <laughs> um, but it was also a time when, because it was right after the pandemic, uh, places had less room. They had, they had been forced to reduce their capacity. So they, the government said, if you have 20 beds, you can only fill 10 of them things like that. So there were less places, fewer places to stay. Um, and some of the places were actually closed because they just couldn't afford to be open. So I was a little leery of just going and seeing what happened. And I ended up making, with the pre-walking and post-walk, I made 42 hotel reservations <laughs> in 42 different places. Thank God for booking.com because <laughs> I, I did half of them through, through them. And it was made it much easier, um, but believe it or not, it worked. <laughs> I managed to keep every one of them, and the route actually worked. So it was it was uh, it was quite an experience. 
Um, the pandemic delayed our departure. We had originally thought we would go in 2020, in April of 2020, right? That was our plan. But of course we bought it. We even bought our tickets. We had our tickets. We bought our tickets over Christmas. My buddy came over New Year's and, and we bought our tickets. And three months later, we had to, we had to send them back. But the airline was very good about giving us a, you know, a, a voucher. Uh, and so that ended up not being a problem, but had way too long to prepare. <laughs> Uh, and I had begun to gather some uh, just prayers and blessings and things that I would just have, you know, when I wanted to think or, you know, wanted something to sort of meditate over or to even to share with other people. I began to gather these things. And after a while, I had quite a, quite a sizable collection. And I showed it to my pastor at the church. And he said, Chris, you should publish that. And I said, oh, no, come on. And then I thought about it and I thought, well, why not? Right? So I did. <laughs> and I, I had a lot of fun. Again, I'm, as you remember from the introduction, I'm a bit of a geek. Um, so I, I laid this out um, on my computer using uh, Adobe InDesign and, and everything. And I found a, I, there was actually a self-publishing uh, place called Lulu that I had used at work before, and they were great. Uh, and so I created a, an ebook and um, and and you can download the ebook for free or you can buy a copy if it's only like eight dollars on Amazon so I brought these little cards if that's interesting to you you can but um, whatever you or you can look at the book as well but um, I had a lot of fun doing it and I'm actually pretty proud of it I you know sometimes you do something like that and you look back and you say yeah but I'm actually pretty proud of it so you can if you're interested you can take a look later and there's information on the, in the handout as well. I, I don't make any money on it, by the way. I'm not, uh, I set it up. It was easier, frankly, to get the permission from the authors if I could tell them I'm not making any money. So that was one of the nice things about Lulu. You can set it up so that you don't make money and that the, all the cost is just the cost of printing the book. Um, so packing, that's not my stuff. <laughs> um, if, if I would not be ashamed if I thought that was feminine and it was mine, but I think it is a, a woman's packing stuff, but it's a great little image of sort of what was in the, what was in the pack. Um, traditionally, as you see on the left there, pilgrims would, would carry a staff, a satchel and a drinking gourd, and they would wear this big broad, broad brimmed hat and a sort of a big cape and leather soled shoes. Um, but we don't do that anymore. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, we're used to convenience. And so it's really hard for people to pack, right? You, you sort of, you get all the stuff that you want to take with you and you sort of, I would, I threw it on my bed, right? And then uh, I had a scale <laughs> and you're looking to try to, uh, to pack no more than, so that it would weigh no more than 10% of your body weight, which for me is generous <laughs> or 16 pounds. I would love it if 16 pounds was one tenth of my body weight. <laughs> I have a long way to go to that. I ended up with 19, which unfortunately still is well within the 10% of my body weight, 19 pounds, and it was okay. It was manageable. Uh, I ended up with 19 pounds. So that's part of the experience of preparing is you've got to figure out what are you taking with you. Um, and uh, there's a lot in the handout, lots of notes if you're thinking about this. So I'm not going to talk to get into super detail about that part. So the experts say that you should be really intentional about leave taking, right? Because this is a, this is a special experience. And so I actually, um, one of the things I'd read was that in the old days, the pilgrims would take a letter from their pastor with them or from their home priest saying, you know, we recommend this person to you, blah, de, blah. I didn't bother getting a letter. But I did ask him for a blessing. And so the Sunday before I left, he trotted me up in the front of the church and actually gave him a blessing to read. And, the, and he did. And it was, it was very nice. Um, I also had two or three groups of people who just, you know, really wanted to wish me well and had these little uh, get togethers uh, before I left. So I really felt very well uh, sent off, shall we say. So in stage four, after you've been prepared and left, you actually start making the way, right? The metaphor here is a lens because you're kind of hoping to see things 
in unexpected ways. Um, and you, you may be treading on holy ground here, but you're gonna have some obstacles, right? There are gonna be things that get in the way. Uh, most of the trail was easy to follow. There were these uh, yellow arrows in different forms. Some of them were on posts like this. Some of them were well hidden. <laughs> it, was, it was a little hard to find them. A couple of times we almost got off the track, um, but didn't. Um, and if, you, if that ever happens, the people in the area you know, are, are always quite happy to help you, right? They're not stupid. <laughs> you know, they know that this is the local economy, so they're nice to the pilgrims, right? Um, and they're, they're nice people anyway. I don't mean to sound cynical about that. Um, so some of the markers would tell you how far you still had to go, right? Um, and in some of the larger cities or, or more uh, ambitious towns, you would see these markers on the street. Um, and they were, they were all different. Each town had a different sort of marker that you'd see in the street if they had them. Um, and sometimes on the path, you would see these markers that uh, people had created. You know, they needed a rest, so they made this sort of thing on the, on the, on the trail with the stones. And on the times when you had to cross a busy, busy street, there were, there were good signs warning people. And again, most of the people on these back roads were locals and they knew that the, here's the place where those dummies from the Camino are crossing. So I've gotta be really careful, right? So it, you really weren't frightened about that typically. So early pilgrims would, uh, would see scallop shells and the, the scallop shell uh, the, the place where you're going at the end of the pilgrimage, Santiago, right, is over here. You can see it's surrounded by, by water, right? So, and on the beaches were these scallop shells. So one indication that you'd been there would be if you could come back with a scallop shell. So that's one of the understandings about why the scallop shell is a symbol of the Camino. And the early pilgrims would wear them on their hats um, nowadays. Some people would you know, wear them like this, you know, around your, your head. <laughs> the truth is, it, 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 in the small towns, it was pretty obvious if you were a pilgrim, right? <laughs> the locals, really, it wasn't like, oh, I wonder if that person's a pilgrim. Not really. <laughs> they kind of knew. Um, certainly the foreigners, they knew, right? But half the people who go on the pilgrimage in Spain are Spanish, right? Okay, the, half of them. So anyway, so people would wear these. Um, and the other thing, the interesting thing that people talk about this uh, being symbolic of is the, the different lines, the sort of striations there sort of mirror the different routes. There's like a dozen different ways to get to Santiago, but they all converge at the one place. So I like being, that's another sort of poetic image that I kind of like. And this is about to fall off again. Okay, so. So on the way, you carry, I think I brought mine, but um, you carry this little passport. It's a full, little folding booklet. It's called the credencial, the credential, the pass, this sort of the pilgrim's passport. And you're supposed to, in each town you go to, each place you spend the night, at least once a day or twice a day, you get a stamp. So, that, so at least the place where you stay is guaranteed to have one of these little stamps. But a lot of places had them. So some of the churches you would go to would have a stamp, the little uh, restaurants you would go to, some of them would have a stamp. And so it was fun to collect them. And some people were absolute sort of maniacs about them and wanted to get as, as many as you could go to the post office and get one of these things too. So that's kind of one of the fun things about the, the Camino. And at the end, you have this great you know, souvenir. Um, you, and if you want to get the certificate, after you finish, you need to have a certain number of stamps on one of these to sort of show that you actually uh, made the trip. Not everybody's interested in the certificate, the Compostela. Uh, so. Okay. So over the course of five weeks, we walked 13 million steps. I actually had a step counter. I wear one of these all the time. And I counted 13 million steps. That's a lot of steps. Um, we, but the cool part about it is we moved at a slow pace. You know, we walked at the pace of nature. You know, we weren't rushing. We weren't biking. We weren't riding cars. We weren't flying. We were just walking at this sort of natural pace. 
Um, and we, we stopped pretty regularly to enjoy the surroundings. And one of the things, if you ever take a long hike or a, a pilgrimage or anything, I strongly urge you to do is periodically turn around. You don't think about it, but the view that you get behind you is different than the one that's in front of you. And it's, you see different things when you turn around. So we made a point periodically to turn around and look back. Um, that's the photographer in me. Um, so, um, and I made time to take uh, every night to do journaling. Um, and I, didn't, I wasn't used to doing that. So because I had such a long time, <laughs> I actually did some research and said, okay, what, if, what should I put in the journal? And I made myself a little card that said, here are some things you can write in your journal, types of things that you can write in your journal. And I put that in the handout because I, I think you enjoy it, actually. You could use it on any kind of a trip. Um, but the, 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 after I finished, the journal was really, really helpful because I wrote down lots of details that I had forgotten right, afterwards. So names of people, places that we stopped, things that I didn't want to forget, I would write those in the journal. So we registered, whoops, we registered here in, at this place in uh, France on our way. Uh, we got our first stamp and then we hoisted up our backpacks. There's my poor friend, the poor guy, the very first day, I told you he had, had, had uh, he'd been a smoker. He didn't realize how much that would affect him. And he was really hurting. It took him a while to get used to it, but he never complained. And I was really proud of him. Um, it was a beautiful day. So we had to walk through the Pyrenees, not the tall, tall, tall Pyrenees, but still they were hills, they were high. Um, we climbed uh, 2000 feet the first day um, into the Pyrenees. So here's a little, oh, it was just beautiful. Just, I mean, breathtaking that first day. It's the toughest day on the entire trip that first day. And it's probably one of the most beautiful. Uh, so you wanna be prepared for that puppy. <laughs> um, this was the first place we stayed, right? Uh, there, the, here, is, oh, the, here are the bunks. It's co-ed, right? So if you're uh, sheepish about having females or males, you know, people of the opposite sex where you're sleeping, you don't wanna do this. <laughs> or you don't wanna stay in the, uh, the hostel. There are other options. Um, and here's what the toilet looked like. Now, I didn't take a picture of the actual toilet. Sorry, this one's clean, but it didn't have a seat. And I was not really ready for that. And it was kind of a traumatic night for me in the first place. And there's this toilet with no seat. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> Luckily, I only saw that one more time on the whole trip. And I just, I don't understand why they chose to do that here. But... So uh, yeah, I guess you bring your own. <laughs> but the coolest thing that happened there was the dinner. Um, and this was unfortunately another thing that was sort of curtailed because of the pandemic, these communal dinners. A lot of places that would have had these didn't have them, but we still managed to have several and thank God we had one the first night. A lot of these people, we stayed friends with the entire time, which is just extraordinary when you think about it. Um, So day two, day two, here we are getting ready to go. We're all geared up. We wake up in the morning, boom, it was thunder and lightning. Luckily by the time breakfast was over, that was over. And we had sort of a light steady rain and we were incredibly lucky in terms of rain. I don't think we had more than three days where we had much rain at all. So we were incredibly lucky. Um, but those, that's something you have to be ready for. Right? Uh, let's see. So we went up another 2,000 feet that day. As I said, that first, we actually split the traditional first day into two days. I can't imagine doing that right off the bat, but lots of people do it. Um, through trees, lots of sheep and cows, right? It was just beautiful. Right, lots of sheep and cows. There we are, the friendly cow. <laughs> we, we, were, we ran into a family of cows at one point that were right in the middle of the road and we kind of had to gently walk around them. I mean, I'm not used to cows. I, don't, I didn't know if they were the, the bull was gonna butt me or what, you know? Um, and then 
we had to walk down 1400 feet and it was muddy and rocky. That was another thing that I was not ready for. There were three or four days when the road was very rocky and that's tough on your feet, it hurts. I mean, your feet get literally get bruised and it does not feel good. Um, and it's interesting because the, on the Camino, a lot of people go the last hundred kilometers because that's the minimum that you can go to get a the certificate. And it's not as long, it's only six or seven days. So it's a reasonable time for a, for a normal human being, right? I don't, I don't downplay the, the value of doing that. But luckily you miss all those really nasty days where it's rocky and stuff. So um, you kind of miss part of, you miss a lot of the experience, but that's all right. Um, let's see. So it was very rocky. And we were very glad to get to the next location. This place was completely different from the place where we had stayed the night before. Nice bunks, lots of room. Um, we liked it a lot. And that night we went to mass. I mean, I'm not a, I'm, I was raised Catholic. I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, but I went to mass several times and, and liked it. And one of the things about the mass here is, is a very famous traditional blessing. And that for me was really a special moment because I was really looking forward to that. <clears throat> and the coolest thing happened, it had been a dull, nasty day. As soon as that blessing finished, the sun came out. It was just weird and, and beautiful. No, you're listening, or you're listening for the voice of God. Well, not the not the voice or orally, but definitely uh, definitely there. So we ate a lot of slices of tortilla. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with the Spanish potato omelet. It's their it's tortilla de patatas, sí señora, and incredibly popular, inexpensive, fills you up, um, very good. Uh, a lot of times they wanted to give you toast and coffee for breakfast. Not a good thing to start out a day. So we learned that fairly quickly and looked for something more substantial because you might not get anything to eat for two or three hours, you know, if you wanted to keep walking. So we, we looked for this. And of course, um, more communal dinners, um, definitely some really special uh, food moments. This was another wonderful dinner. Um, again, these are some people that we met, we saw over and over again. Um, and one of the fun things about that night was, this is paella, of course, and there, was, there were two of these hostels. In Spain, they're called albergues, right? The, and French is auberge, but it's a hostel, right? Um, and there were one across, across the street from each other, right? And the one where we were staying had this communal dinner with paella for, I think it was nine and a half euros or something. You could pay a little extra for the dinner. The place across the street advertised their paella and it was only nine euros. So I, I joked that they were in the paella wars there. You know? <laughs> um, the grapes, oh man, we walked. So we, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with the Spanish wines, but Rioja is a Spanish wine. So you walk right through the Rioja region at the beginning and you walk through all these vineyards. And you, I tried really hard not to go and grab because it was just the time of the harvest and every, you know, in September and we're out there and these, the vines are just crawling with these grapes and you are thirsty and everything. And I was really good about it. But luckily we came to this one place where the, the, the vineyard owner was out there and he was actually giving, I think they might've had more than they needed or he was just feeling generous. They were so good. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, these small scallops are called samburinas or thamburinas if you're Spanish, and they were amazing. They're, they're just little, I think there's, a, there's an English name for them, but they're just little scallops and they were so good. Oh my Lord. You know, normally we stuck with sort of boring food, but occasionally we would splurge. Right? At one uh, restaurant, we got our own little uh, veal rump steak to grill on that stone. You see the stone over there on the left? So we would get that and you could cut it up in pieces and you could grill it. And you had to do it fast because this stone lost its heat <laughs> before too long. But that was another sort of a great uh, meal. When we got to Galicia, uh, Galicia has, some, has its own special cuisine. 
And this is something called caldo, which is like a soup or a stew made with uh, white beans and pork and greens. And it's really good. So we had caldo. And then we had some octopus, which, which was very spicy. This particular preparation was it. And in Galicia, you also have to have cider. So we had hard cider. And so I felt like, man, we had a really, we had a really Galician meal that night. So, um, so the food is a, is a big deal, big part of it. So stage five, you're walking the way. Part of walking the way is negotiating this labyrinth. And that's, this is where a lot of, we talk about dealing with obstacles and those obstacles can come in fear. They could be in uh, exhaustion, doubt, injury, other, all kinds of things. And I need to start moving fast. Um, and the metaphor is this ball of thread, which uh, comes from the legend of, uh, Ariadne giving Theseus the thread to get himself out of the, the maze, the Minotaur's maze, right? So, um, and one of the also interesting kind of poetic things that Cousineau talks about at this stage is how the pilgrimage takes you from dark or from light to dark and then light again. I really liked that image. So I thought I would share some, some moments of light and darkness. Yeah, I'll try to move a little faster here. Uh, this fourth week uh, was, uh, so there's Theseus, yada, yada, there's a maze, yada, yada, lots of pictures. I was dreading this fourth week. We had some of the really toughest days. We, um, so we leave this one town before sunrise, and we're trying to get to this very special place, the, um, the Iron Cross. It's one of the highest points on the route, and the tradition is that you leave a stone behind, and here's my stone right here <laughs> that I brought. I got it up uh, in, uh, in the UP and uh, polished it myself with my Dremel tool before I left uh, and left that behind. And that, there's a little prayer that you can say and everything. But three miles away is one of the toughest descents. And this is one of those places where the road was, where it was just nasty, you know, with the stones and everything. And we decided, we were gonna go a different way. There's an alternate route you can take on a road. And we took that. Well, <laughs> that was also kind of scary. So here's the rocks, right? This wasn't the route we, well, this was, a, we walked this much of it until we found the highway. Um, but the highway had a lot of switchbacks. And so there were some blind corners and they were scary <laughs> because you, you didn't know if people were gonna be paying attention to. So it was tough. It was. That was, that was stressful for me. And when we got down to the bottom of the, th I, was, I was so grateful to hear that, to get here. And I talked with some people and they said, you know, you might be stressed out, <laughs> but I saw this one person that was literally was crying. They were so just relieved from the stress of walking through that nastiness that they were just, they were just crying. It was, oof. so, um, And the next day, <laughs> we had to do this. So we're going up. So we started in the rain before midnight. My friend actually used his iPhone flashlight because we didn't have a flashlight. And I found out those flashlights actually last a long time and they don't drain the battery, which was interesting. And they're pretty, they're pretty powerful. <laughs> So we were lucky. So the rain turned into a, a, a rainbow and we, were, we thought that would make a good omen. Um, so we moved along, pretty scenery. We're climbing, we're, we get to this, the bottom of that hill that you saw on the, on the elevation map there. And we stopped and we had some beet soup, which was the weirdest thing. I'd never heard of people in Spain drink, eating beet soup, but there it was. And so we started that and we started up the hill, right? And it was, this wasn't so bad, right? Going up the hill and we hit Galicia. This is a famous image from the Camino. You get to the border of Galicia and the people in Galicia, which is the North uh, Western region are very good with the Camino. They're good with the trails. They take really good care of it. And um, we were just very happy to get there. And we actually, it was really, it was kind of a super relief to make it. I had looked at that map of that day, those 200,000 feet we had to climb. And I said, we're not gonna make it. And we did. 
which was I was I was just amazed. So we went to mass in this church, and this is the church where that famous Don Elias um, had done his thing. So it was a cool place to be. There were times on the trip when you sort of felt like, you know, I'm not a Catholic, I don't belong in mass. But this priest, before the mass, he, we got there early and he says, anybody willing to read? And I said, I'm not shy. I said, sure, I'll read. Um, and I, when we were, were walking up to the altar, I said, is it okay that I'm not a Catholic? And he said, oh, no problem. You know, like without even blinking. And I'll tell you a little bit more <laughs> comes from that. So it was nice to be there. And then the next morning, we see this. I mean, I took that. I mean, you did, this isn't something I pulled out of some art book. I, this was just breathtaking. We got up in the morning. You could see the clouds over the hills. And it, while the sun hadn't started to come up yet, I said to my friend, we're, we're going to wait here. And we're going to watch the sunrise. And we sat there for 45. I was crying. It was, it was amazing. Oh. So that was a you know, moments of darkness and light, right? Sorry. <laughs> so part of my spiritual, the spiritual end of things, I was, as I said, listening for the voice of God. So we left, we're kind of jumping around here. The day after we left Pamplona, we get to this place called the Hill of Pardon, which is a, a very uh, famous part of the thing. I was thinking about forgiveness. So, so pardon, forgiveness. I was thinking about that when I'm walking up the hill and feeling very spiritual in the process and a strong wind comes up and I honestly felt I was hearing the voice of God. Um, and it was just, it really, it really moved me. I mean, it's, it's why you think I was looking at the windmill. It's, that's not, I didn't think that was God. <laughs> I didn't think God was in the windmill, but that wind, it was just, there was just something about it. Um, and we get up to the top and there's this wonderful sculpture that sort of pilgrims throughout the ages. And on the other side of the hill is this memorial. And this was also very moving. This is a memorial to local people who were killed during the Spanish Civil War. So each of these pillars has the name of a town and several people who were killed and never found. And it was very moving. So late, later that day, I'm walking through these trees and I'm, I'm kind of exhausted because, you know, walking up and then down again, it wasn't a huge hill, but it was a long day and I was tired. And I was sitting yeah, there, just feeling a little, and all of a sudden this tailwind comes up and it was powerful and it just sort of pushed me along. And I just, I felt that same voice again. And it really, I'm not, I don't tend to, to have those experiences. And so it was really quite a day for me. So darkness and light. As I said, not all pilgrims are Catholic, um, I, but I was welcome almost everywhere that, that I went, you know, I, and I, I didn't try to pretend I was Catholic. Uh, we went into this um, little chapel, and these little ladies inside, these, these sisters of charity, they didn't ask, you know, are you, are you even a Christian? And they just offered you this, this little medal and a blessing. And it was just, it was really wonderful. I didn't take mine off for a month. <laughs> um, that same evening though, we went to mass in this church and the priest actually refused communion to a person who wouldn't tell him that he, she was Catholic. And I think she didn't speak Spanish. She went up thinking she would get communion and the priest wouldn't give her, wouldn't give her communion. And, <sighs> It made me really angry. And later on, I was angry at myself for being angry. <laughs> and I left and a bunch of people left at that time. Um, a fortune, uh, um, um, apparently, the priest was very apologetic about it later on. Um, my friend, uh, who was right in the middle there, um, was there the next day. And the guy was all smiles and very nice and not being a jerk. <laughs> and uh, um, and in the end, I was really more angry with myself because one of the things I had really firmly resolved that I would not do on the Camino was judge people. And I judged this guy. I thought, I know more than him. I know why he's doing this because he's evil or something like that. And I don't know why he did it. Um, so another one of those neat little experiences. 
And this is a wonderful little, uh, this is a building that was in ruins 15 years ago. This group in Italy refurbished it and now they come and spend two weeks at a time and they run the little hostel there. Uh, inside that building. I think they have two or three beds or something. It was just a neat little place. Um, a group of Marist fathers run this uh, uh, hostel. And the one priest who was in his 70s was, was um, telling us that uh, about all his experiences in, in Argentina and nasty places that he had worked and tough prisons and things like that, that he had, had worked. And at age 75, he decided I need to learn English so I can so that I can run this hustle. And I know it's hard to learn a language the older you get. 75, that's, a, that's pretty amazing. Um, I really felt humbled to get his blessing in this church. I just, this is a cool guy. Okay, stage six, you arrive. Uh, the metaphor is a gift. I'm gonna try to move a little faster. One of the greatest gifts I felt that I got received was friendship. We met some amazing people. Here's a couple, Romanian couple from Madrid. This is my dear friend, Rolando, who's a Cuban born banker who lives in Kansas. Uh, Marcel, the guy in the middle there, a, a, a Brazilian born lock maker from Texas. And my good friends, Roy and Patricia from, from uh, California. That's my buddy that I walked with on the left there. And here we are, right? Several weeks after that opening dinner, this is a group of us and we're still getting together every night and having a beer and, and just talking about the day. Um, it really, the, making the friends and, and keeping, that was amazing. Um, two weeks ago when it was St. James Day, we, you know, we had a bunch of little WhatsApps and, and uh, messages going back and forth. It was really nice. Um, one of our, the coolest people we met that second night this is Caitlin. Um, she was stuck with us two nights in a row, <laughs> like in the bed across from us. And so we got to know her. Um, we're a yeah, couple of days later, we're having tapas or pinchos as they call them in, in this part of the town, part of the country. We're sitting here having tapas and it comes out that she is a Navy pilot. And I went, what? What? I'm already impressed as hell with you. And now I learn you're a Navy pilot? <laughs> <laughs> um, so later on, uh, yeah, there she is. She actually teaches people how to fly, you know, like 737s and things. I just like in her thirties, <laughs> it's crazy. Really impressive young woman. And she met her wife in, uh, in Sarria and they finished uh, the pilgrimage together. And at the end, uh, we somehow met the very last night before we went back to Madrid to get the plane. We happened to be in the same town and we had dinner. It was one of the, the, my favorite um, memories from the, <clears throat> from the whole trip. Just two really cool ladies. So we arrive in Santiago, so there's a little rain. At the edge of town is this guy playing the bagpipes. They do play bagpipes in other places besides Scotland. They're very big in, in uh, Galicia. There was a real sense of pride when we received, there's my Compostela. Uh, that's the one on the left. I think the other one is the mileage certificate or something. I had them framed because I thought they were pretty cool. The main square was bustling. We got to see the, the tomb, right? That's where the, the bones are. And unfortunately, when we went to mass that, that night, we didn't get to see the, the bota fumeiro, the big thing, the thing that's, there's a huge incense burner that swings all the way across this church. And they don't do it every mass, unfortunately. So we... That's one thing we didn't see it. I'll live. So in stage seven, you bring back the boon, right? Um, you're going to tell your story. This is a metaphor as an awakening. Um, and who knows stages borrow heavily from Campbell's model of the hero's journey. Uh, Joseph Campbell once wrote, the goal of a quest is wisdom and the power to serve others. I really like that. The goal is wisdom and the power to serve others. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the boon is my little. Um, so we, like I said, we had, that walk, we had the opportunity to walk slowly <laughs> outdoors. And I actually took this picture on the Camino um, at the pace. I could see the world. I wasn't rushing, right? One of the coolest things we saw on the trip was this uh, house of the gods, this a man named David Vidal. And he sleeps outside this guy and he runs this little place. He gives away food 
and water. He lives out, outside and he's been doing this for years, like 10 or 15 years he's been doing this. And he just, he gets the money from people who give him money to, to do this. And he was just a fascinating, it's one of those people you meet and you say, is this guy for real, right? Or is this an act? I, he's for real. Um, and I talked to him and he said, once he, this is very loosely translated. He was sitting outside and looking up at the stars and he says this little prayer, but roughly translated, God, you done good. <laughs> and I just, that was really, that's what I came away with from the Camino, right? Um, God's earth is beautiful and I need to do everything I can to keep it so that it stays that way. And that's, that was a big thing that I came away with. So the work that I do um, in different groups, oops, right? So I work with this one conservation group. Um, I work in a, I have a local hiking club. I have information about a hike next Tuesday, if you're interested, uh, down in Saugatuck. I made this, um, I have a group in my church that I'm involved with. And to share my story, I made a photo book for my family and a few other friends. If you're welcome, to, you're welcome to come and look. I'm actually kind of proud of that. I took a boatload of pictures. <laughs> and of course, all right, I've just finished telling this story to you all, right? So, and I've done that before a couple of times. Um, so now you can have the handout, do you mind? And I brought, as you can see, I brought several of my favorite books about the Camino. If you're interested, I have the book about the pilgrimage. I have a great little cookbook, a cook of recipes from the Camino. It's really wonderful. We've made several things from there. I believe it is, but you can find that anywhere. I could probably tell it to you off the top of my head because I make them all the time. Um, you're welcome to come and take a look. Um, and I feel very badly that I left this book off the handout. This is Rich Ray's book that was published this spring. Um, and I did find out that it's in the Hope College bookstore. It's, they also have a copy at Reader's World. You can get it on Amazon. And it's in Hoopla. Do you know Hoopla? Yeah. The ebook thing, so you can read it for free in Hoopla. So I hope you find the handout useful. I managed, intended to leave more time than this. Um, but questions, comments? Yes. You took a lot of nice pictures. So, and you were carrying 19 pounds. What did you use for a camera? Was it your phone? Phone. Okay. I actually upgraded my phone the fall before. Yeah. I, I debated a long time whether I would take a little camera or the phone and I just couldn't see having that extra thing That's to deal way. with. You could even use your diary, put your diary in your phone. Um, the other question I had was at the very beginning, you were talking about the people who are doing all these pilgrimages from various religions. Do you have any breakdown of what percentage of people from various religions do these kinds of pilgrimages? I don't, no, sorry. I just, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I would not be that adventurous. However, um, during the pandemic, I did the virtual ones. Oh, yeah. And what was interesting, it, you pay something like 50 or $60, yep. but the money went to those people who were hurting because they weren't getting the pilgrims. So that made me feel better. And then you got to see a lot of those pictures, not probably as nice as yours, but we saw a lot of pictures and then you'd st they'd stamp your little thing each day. So if I never printed it out, but I've got my whole thing and the thing at the end. So it was really cool. Was that the one that Johnny Walker did? Is that what you're talking about? Um, so there's a, a guy who's fairly famous on the Camino named Johnny Walker. And he did one of those. And he actually wrote a really nice book, too, that I, I didn't. Oh, I think it is on the list there. So that I recommend. Yeah, but, but you can still join these. You yeah. know, you just Google the Camino and, and join one. Yeah. So. And I feel bad. I've got to leave. Got to be somewhere. <laughs> yes. Did you have like a travel guide that you went to to, to make this trip? Available there are to you? a mountain of websites, and I started with a, a a general route, and then I just kind of divided up when I thought there were too many miles on a particular day, and and went from there. And I I kind of did my own. I like to set up my own trips, but I used a TripAdvisor. 
uh, for to kind of see. And there was a great website that compared all the different albergues and had uh, reviews of them and everything. So I, like I said, I had way too much time to figure all this out. <laughs> Others? You had mentioned the pilgrimage of Canterbury. Yes. Do you have any other information about that? And and is it related to the windows of Canterbury also that? Uh, I don't pilgrimage... know. I actually read a nice, a really nice book and I forget what it was called, but but there is a lot out there on the, that pilgrimage. It starts in London and it goes to Canterbury. And I think it's another one where there's a fair number of things, places you can stay. I don't think it's as rural as this. I think there's a lot of, uh, walking on city streets that's part of that um but that's an that's one i would love to do actually so you walk to thomas uh, beckett's tomb in canterbury which i think is interesting because you know because it was the beckett was i can't remember whether beckett was before the protestant or was he a, was he a catholic he must have been protestant if it's a, if it's a big and, Pro, and protestants don't do pilgrimages so i thought that was interesting anyway Yes, that would be one to learn more about. I wish I could give you some good resources for that, but I can't. Thank you for a stellar program. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I can identify this cathedral, but it was about midway through your talk that had something that looked like a large silver circle at the ceiling level, and it was tilted, it looked like, in your picture. Do you know what that significance oh, was? Oh, gosh. Okay, never mind. There I are, was inside the church. It was in about that big arch on the altar. So there are I, I, a no, lot in the of ceiling. Yeah, yeah. there are a lot of very elaborate churches, even in small towns, where they got, you know, the local lord to give a whole bunch of money. Um, but there are there are two really there are two or three very famous cathedrals. Three, eh? well, there's one in Burgos, there's one in Leon, and of course the cathedral in Santiago are huge. And there are other churches, but those are the one in Burgos and the one in Leon are some of the most famous uh, cathedrals in the world. It's like a halo. Is that likely to be a significant piece or not? It doesn't matter. I, I, can't, I can't remember. I was I'll, just look, curious. I'll look and see if I can. <laughs> the other quick it. question is, it looked like on your certificate that you got at the end that it was Gregory Clark. So my first name is George. Oh, so on my passport, it says George. I don't go by my first name. <laughs> But they used my passport, so it says Georgos or something like that, trying to be Latin. It's really so, a Greek name. So when you when you reached your destination, did you have to sign a register? Because I saw the movie, The Way, and I remember that he wanted to sign his son's name, I thought, uh, because he was making the walk for him who didn't complete it. And I thought there was an issue about who could really sign. I don't remember, but it's yeah. quite possible that he wanted to get the Compostela, the certificate, yeah, with his yeah. son's name, and they wouldn't let him do that. It would have to be right. His, it was something passport. to have that because they had yeah. to sign at the end. Yeah, and I don't remember was... anything I had to sign, but but I yeah. could see, I can understand. Yeah, that. it was and symbolic to that. him yeah. for his son. It is a wonderful movie. Whether you ever plan to go on the, it's just the scenery will blow you away, yeah. if nothing else. Yes. We left September fifteenth, and we came. We finished the October twenty fifth or something. That worked out really well for us. We had planned to do April fifteenth to like the the end of May. Um, those are like off season times when it could be a little cold, like at the end of April. And it could have been a little cold at the end of October, but I like them. You miss the, you know, a lot of the flowers and things like that, but uh, there's, but it gets very busy in the middle of the summer. It's really, really hot. Now they're actually in the middle of forest fires, you know, bad ones, even in September now in Spain. Did you use walking sticks? I did. Okay. And I have something on the handout about, you know, what what stuff. You have choices. Do you want one stick, two sticks, no sticks, or a big wooden stick? I had two sticks. <laughs> yeah, and you can't carry them on, which is weird on a plane. So you have to you have to check them if you want to take them. And I was too cheap to do that, so I bought two. It was cheaper to buy two and leave them in Spain. Um, but I would not do that again. I would take mine because I like mine. <laughs> I would pay to check them. <laughs> I, I, in the handout, I list like what backpack I used and what shoes I have, and because 
you know, if you're in, if you're thinking about this, those are details you might be curious about. I think going to a lot of masses, and, and that was in the evening. Yes, yeah, they evening. would almost always have mass at like six or seven o'clock. Um, and oddly, a lot of the churches were closed. So as you're walking along, you couldn't go to church. Now, I think they were just being careful with, with the pandemic and not mm -hmm. exposing volunteers to, you know, needless uh, stuff. So you couldn't, there were a lot of places that I wanted to see that I couldn't see because they just were only open for mass. Did you hear some good music? Oh, I wished I could, but no. <laughs> No, no, that I looked too. Yeah, I was really hoping I could see a gait of it, you know, like a concert of this bagpipe. So we got to hear a little bit of that in Santiago. That's really the extent of the music. Yeah. Nope. I'm sorry, I didn't, I was trying to, I just got carried away. I hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>